For something closely related to that topic. Uh, <laughs> I can't promise that exactly. I'll at least provide a few uh, well, thoughts about uh, what's going on here in Harvard Forest, what the potential is, and, and what we might do as we kind of uh, continue to move that, that research agenda forward. Um, we had a, a nice set of papers that came out from Frontiers in the College of Environment on a couple of biogeo chemical cycles uh, last month. And that was uh, uh, an activity that John Cole led in the Institute of Ecosystem Studies, which Bill had alluded to earlier, but uh, I worked with him on that, so we've got Holland. And, and uh, it, was, uh, it was very interesting, and we learned lots of things about it. And I certainly learned a lot about a couple of biogeo chemical cycles as a result of participating in that activity. And, you know, I would definitely say that a couple of biogeochemical cycles are basically essential to understanding ecosystem function, and that's because organisms require macro and micronutrients in very specific ratios, and that has consequences for the distribution of, of these elements uh, across the land surface and the water and the oceans. Um, you can see that uh, N to P and C to N to P ratios express themselves at molecular scales. For example, ATP has an N to P ratio of 5 to 3 at organ scales at organismal scales and at abiotic scales. And all of these things reflect essentially the integrated effect of organisms on the pools and fluxes of carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus in those ecosystems. Um, so within that sort of context, or this, this context of trying to understand a couple of biogeochemical cycles, I just went to the Harvard Forest uh, Data Archive and sort of poked around to see, well, okay, what, what biogeochemical cycles you know, do we have well represented here? By far the winners are carbon, water, uh, and nitrogen. Uh, and in the experimental manipulations, which is primarily where I drew uh, data from, it was primarily uh, soil respiration as the carbon cycle variable and uh, net nitrogen mineralization as the, as the nitrogen cycle variable. So the data sets here are pretty rich in, in those two elements. Um, they're certainly uh, the pauper and phosphorus, so I'm going to actually make a plug here to say that you know I think that there's good reasons why we want to know about phosphorus supply and availability, for example. Um, the chronic nitrogen fertilization experiment uh, showed strong response to nitrogen initially, but uh, there's no increase in productivity, sorry, productivity increased initially, uh, but there's been no subsequent increase in productivity in the last five or ten years. I don't know the exact numbers, but let's got those. Um, maybe it's phosphorus limitation that we've now used, and we know nothing about that, uh, really, at least as far as the data archives tell me. So, um, so there's uh, lots of interesting things, and there's lots of uh, places to kind of uh, enrich that data set. So in the spirit of this kind of coupled biogeochemical cycles thing, I thought, well, why don't I just take a look at the available data on uh, soil respiration rates and nitrogen mineralization rates in the uh, sort of uh, experimental manipulations, the large ecosystem scale experimental manipulations, and can they tell us something about the nature of the, couple, uh, the coupling of biogeochemical cycles? So, um, it turns out that the data are collected oftentimes at sort of different um, uh, temporal scales. In particular, some have year-long estimates, some have growing season estimates of soil respiration. Um, and so it kind of made it hard to di uh, directly compare observations on the original scale. So I just took a pseudo-meta-analytic approach to the analysis and just calculated the response ratio for um, total soil respiration for whatever measurement interval was available in the data set. Uh, in the experimental treatment plot relative to what it is in, in the control plot. And so I've tried to color code this a little bit here. So these first red plots are, for example, uh, the work that Alex and Samita are doing on the morning by nitrogen addition plot. Um, these are plots of total soil respiration in sort of a calendar year order, I believe, uh, from the uh, nitrogen product and uh, manipulations. Uh, Eric Davidson's uh, uh, through fall displacement experiments. The hurricane blowdown has a few measurements. This is from Mega Warm. These are all the dirt soil respiration. That's the double litter, no litter trenching experiment. And these are the data from um, the original uh, soil warming experiment. And what's interesting about this, actually, as I was thinking about it a little bit more, is that you can almost think of this as a um, way of looking at sort of the homeostasis, if you will, of these ecosystems in response to kind of very different types of experimental manipulations. That is to say, you know, you increase sort of respiration by about 50%, but not a whole lot more, or you can decrease it by a bunch more, maybe up to 70%, depending. These are very extreme types of manipulations where you cut out all carbon inputs, and so you'd expect them to have low respiration rates. But anyway, that's, you know, so this is sort of the bound, if you will, uh, in the Harvard Forest for the ability of these drivers of global change to affect uh, soil respiration. 
Um, 50% increase or 50% decrease, it's really big. So those are really uh, large variations, and obviously we want to spend a whole lot more time thinking about the drivers. But one of the things that we would want to talk about is spend time thinking about what are the common drivers that might be able to explain uh, this amount of variation among all of these uh, experiments. Um, so that's my, my carbon cycle um, uh, synthesis from, from the, the data archive. And this is a very preliminary uh, synthesis. Uh, I looked at the same thing for uh, net mineralization rates. There are fewer data available on uh, net nitrogen mineralization rates. But again, I just calculated the same sort of response ratio, the rate of net mineralization in the treatment plot relative to its control. And there's a couple things that I think are interesting about this slide, particularly in comparison to the slow respiration slide. Um, one is that, in general, you increase rates of mineralization no matter what the type of uh, experimental manipulation you're doing. And secondly, the response ratios are much broader, right, up to two and a half times greater in a treatment plot relative to a control plot. So that upper bound is much higher for net nitrogen mineralization than for carbon mineralization. And so that's sort of interesting. Uh, maybe Steve's fault. Well, Steve Wops, he's right when he tells me that the trees get the nitrogen that they need, and maybe the underlying pattern is that nitrogen cycling variables are very plastic. On the other hand, there may be cases where a lot of this is related to things like, for example, how long was the study conducted for? And one way to think a little bit about that is, for example, in this original warming uh, study here, these are the first couple of years of warming, these are the next couple, and then after about six or seven years, right, there's really no longer stimulation in nitrogen mineralization rates from the soil. Uh, in response to more. So when we're thinking about sort of putting these uh, data sets together, it tells us something about potential homeostasis. It also tells us something about uh, how the carbon and the nitrogen cycles uh, respond to these drivers of global change. So then I thought it would be interesting to plot um, the rate of nitrogen mineralization as a function of the rate of soil respiration, because primarily uh, a big component of that soil respiration is a heterotrophic carbon flux, it's microbial decomposition of soil organic matter. And you would predict that with increases in soil respiration, at least to a first approximation, you would predict an increase in nitrogen mineralization rates. And these are the results as I found them, just like that. <laughs> Bummer. Well, you know, if I want to be dramatic, I say, well, we can't do it, right? We have different collection techniques, we have different measurement intervals, different assumptions about how to scale. Um, and to a first approximation, that's true. But of course, there's always a solution, and the solution lies in that and that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you just need some time and some money, and then you can do it, actually, right? I mean, there are ways to gap fill, there are ways to produce a common model to, to scale things, for example, temperature for soil respiration or soil moisture or some combination of both. And so this kind of leads me, I guess, to a couple of questions that I thought in the context of, uh, you know, LTER5 and the planning discussions around that. Uh, first of all, is data synthesis important to the LTER and can and should we use the information from the past to guide future experiments? It seems to me that um, so far uh, there's been a lot of work done on individual studies, and I think somebody alluded to this a little bit earlier today, but there actually hasn't been cross-study synthesis within a particular place in the Harvard Forest. And I think that there's a tremendous amount of information uh, and knowledge to be gained from doing that. And so the question is, should data synthesis be a part of the next LTER proposal, or should it happen prior to it, or some combination of both of those things? And I guess that's a point for discussion. Um, I had another thought. This is probably a little wackier. But um, I also sort of thought about, well, could you stress common use of techniques, uh, instruments, like a Lycor 6400 for soil respiration? or 28-day uh, incubations for net nitrogen mineralization. Um, as a component of the sort of process for accepting proposals to do research. Now, on the one hand, that would have lots of benefits, right? Because now the data are harmonized from study to study to study. They're the same instruments, same measurement intervals, and so on and so forth. The obvious downside of that, though, is that you know, investigators will come in and they've got the money that they've got, so they may or may not be able to do everything exactly like how we might want them to be able to do. Sometimes you do things on a, sometimes you do things on a shoestring budget. So obviously you can't really force that. But then the crazy thought that I had was whether or not we possibly develop a sort of a research instrument in the language of the major research instrumentation panel at NSF, which would basically be a grant to this major research instrumentation 
program for instruments that are commonly used in biogeochemical cycles. Could you have two or three Lycor 6400s? Could you have two or three auto analyzers? Could you have some uh, auto chambers that were available for use that essentially become a research instrument that investigators can then use? That would certainly help promote sort of uniformity in the methods of, of data collection, and there may be some value to that. And I think you could actually motivate that as a concept to uh, MRI. So another sort of thought, I guess. Adrian, isn't that called neon? <laughs> well, it is, but you, I think the thing about neon is that neon is only going to do what it is doing, and you may want to be doing other things. And so if you want to be doing other things here at the Harvard Forest, if you have equipment that, that people can use, then you, know, you still get the condensation. I would say similar to that, we would want the equipment that neon has to do similar measurements. Uh, yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah. So we so, so that's just um, that's just a, a few ideas. So now I'm actually going to step a little bit more into my my labs research, just because it's something that I, I know pretty well and data that I can access very easily and, and kind of use to, to create a story. But my point in showing you these data are that uh, that they're just sort of placeholder ideas. There's going to be lots of different ways in which you can envision doing similar things. So. In this context of a couple of biogeochemical cycles, I'm thinking specifically about the carbon and nitrogen cycles, um, there is this really interesting potential for below ground carbon allocation by plants to actually increase the supply of nitrogen back to plants. And that happens primarily through what we're starting to term a carbon pushing sort of nutrient return framework. The idea being that you know, plants are photosynthesizing, they're actively taking up carbon, and some of that carbon is flowing below ground to grow roots and to support live roots. And some additional amount of that carbon is going into uh, the rhizosphere, which is sort of the zone of soil immediately around roots, as a result of uh, three minutes of, okay, I'll move quickly. Uh, as a result of, uh, of exudation of labile carbon out of roots, and also the mycorrhizal fungi, and, and both in the rhizosphere and in the bulk soils uh, with mycorrhiza and bacteria and all the different microbes that are out there, you can actually stimulate soil organic matter decomposition uh, and nitrogen cycle. And so this is interesting from the context of two things. One is, uh, is this a good model for thinking about how the cycles of carbon and nitrogen are coupled to one another? Uh, particularly, that's an important challenge from the perspective of the Eddyflux community because the Eddyflux community thinks you can do everything up here. The biogeochemical community says, wait a minute, you have to focus on this too. But these two communities really haven't sort of connected yet. Uh, and so I think that this is a tool for thinking about how to do that. Um, I'm going to quickly run out of time. So I'll just do a quick highlights tour on this one, maybe skip the next. Um, one of the things that we're particularly interested in is figuring out, well, okay, uh, to what extent do you get this carbon push resulting in decomposition of soil organic matter? And one way that we attacked that was just to do a literature search looking at things like the rate of uh, microbial respiration in the rhizosphere or the biomass of microbes in the rhizosphere relative to bulk soils. And again, this is just a sort of a response ratio, so values greater than one indicate a higher uh, rate of rhizosphere respiration and greater microbial biomass. And these are uh, different studies. Um, we've been very conservative in the way we've actually averaged the data. And uh, what they show almost unequivocally, whether you're in a grassland, a forest land, in the Arctic, in an agricultural system, is that all of these microbial processes are significantly stimulated in the rhizosphere uh, relative to the bulk soil. So that also goes for things like extracellular enzyme activities, which are the ultimate engines that are responsible for the decomposition of Soil organic matter. There's probably uh, 20 or so different extracellular enzymes that have been assayed in this context. Okay. Well, one of the things that has come up, I think, in the last two presentations were ideas about seasonality. Um, I think that seasonality to the coupling of carbon and nitrogen cycling below ground is also a really, really important area. Uh, Mark Bradford from Yale has done some interesting work here at Forming Experiments looking at the relationship between uh, mass specific rates of uh, respiration and say uh, the temperature at which uh, the soils are found. And in general, what this is showing is that as you go through the growing season or as you manipulate temperatures uh, with a warming experiment, you're getting a decline <coughs> in the rate of respiration with increases in temperature. That is, there's some kind of acclimation of the microbial community. 
We see that expressed for proteolytic enzymes. We also see that expressed in nitrogen mineralization rates. Um, this is a plot of net nitrogen mineralization take, taken from maple oak forest here at Harvard Forest and hemlock forest here at Harvard Forest. And if you just look at this uh, temperature profile, this is net mineralization as a function of soil incubation temperature. These were data uh, from samples that were collected in June. And from the same plots for samples collected in October, you can see that the rate of uh, net mineralization per unit uh, per fixed temperature is significantly lower. So another kind of view on this acclimation issue. Okay, I'm going to have to go. So um, let me finish by just going through my bucket list, if you will, right here. Um, it's a partial bucket list, not because I don't think there's enough here, but just that it represents my bias, obviously. Um, one of the things that I would say is, are we gaining suffi sufficient mechanistic understanding of key ecosystem response variables when we're only thinking about soil respiration and that nitrogen mineralization? I think the answer is, um, yeah, I think we're missing some really important things, and, and I can talk more about that later in the Q&A, maybe. Um, if I wanted to get at some of these things, well, what would I really want to know? Well, I'd like to know something about the phenology of both above and below the ground uh, uh, activity, particularly roots below the ground. Um, if I wanted to say something about truly coupled biogeochemical cycles, I'd want to know about phosphorus cycling. If I cared about my data entering into models, I'd want to do some mass balances for these different biogeochemical cycles. <coughs> really important constraints on models. If I wanted to get uh, really slick, for example, to think about where the water is coming from in drought years, I might want to use natural abundance material isotopes to get at that. And I think we definitely need to think about developing molecular tools, and I guess NEON is doing it, but again, I think there's going to be cases where there are studies that we're doing uh, separate from the NEON where we want these uh, to co characterize microbial community composition, or better, I think, targeted, uh, uh, targeted sort of probing uh, uh, at the molecular level uh, for things like processes, nitrogen fixation, denitrification as, as two examples. Um, I think that we should think about in LTR5 greater emphasis on modeling, because modeling helps integrate all these different data sources that we can synthesize from the LTER. And importantly, the best thing you can do with a model is test different kinds of hypotheses. Um, typically right now, all the models are being used for forecasting, um, and they're always going to be wrong, and we, we know that, and that's okay, but I think they'd be much more useful for testing hypotheses, and I think that would be a good uh, line for discussion. And then I think finally it's also worth thinking about what are the next generation experiments of interest. Um, are, we, are, we, are we done with warming alone or <laughs> should we be warming with precipitation? I mean, that's a pretty obvious um, experiment to do in the global change context. Is there any value in redirecting the existing experiments that have gone on for a long time and kind of plateaued in the information game? For example, should we add phosphorus to the nitrogen saturation plots? Um, should we irrigate some of the original warming plots and look at these temperature by precipitation interactions. And then also when you're designing experiments, this idea of gradient versus step change approaches is also something that's worth uh, thinking about. So um, there's a bit of a bucket list of things to think about, um, and I'll stop there, I guess. <laughs>